faith is that which connects what God has stored in the heavenly with what is here on earth. Faith is the bridge between the natural and the supernatural. Faith is how we please God. Every believer is called to live a life of faith. And when you live a life of faith, you live a life of surrender to and dependency upon the Holy Spirit. You learn to listen to his voice. Even when other voices are calling your attention to the things of this world. When fear shouts, what if? Faith boldly declares, even if. When deception and turmoil and all of the distractions of this world try to pull us from that purposeful path that God has laid before us, faith is focused. Faith clings to the promises of God. Faith says within its heart, if God has truly declared it, then I will sincerely believe it. If God has ordered it, I will do it. Faith does not let go of what God has said. Every word that God has spoken hangs in eternity. It does not lose power over time. God does not change his mind. He does not take back what he says. When God promises something, when God declares something, those who believe what he has said will experience the fruit of what he has promised. It takes steps of faith to accomplish the will of the Father. Far too many believers are small-minded because far too many believers are focused on the here and the now. Distracted by the daily trappings of entertainment and sinful pleasure. The attention is so often pulled from the heavenly realm. Things clamor for us. Things desire us. And we, if we're not careful, can begin to give into those tethers that Keep us grounded in only the earthly. When you live the life of faith, you begin to think like God thinks. When you live the life of faith, you begin to actually believe, you dare to believe that what God says is true. I dare you to believe that miracles still happen. I dare you to believe that the Holy Spirit still has the power to drive out demonic beings. I dare you to believe that he who formed the body can heal the very same. God has not gone silent. He didn't go deaf or blind, or mute. God still sees. God still hears. And my friend, God still speaks. <laughs> but only those who are positioned in faith can truly experience all that God offers. When the woman with the issue of blood who had suffered several years, said within herself that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. She was making a commitment to faith, despite having been disappointed time and time again. How many times do you think her hopes were up? And then how many times do you think her hopes came crashing down? But still, she said within her heart, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And with that stretch of faith with that single act she received of his power to the point where Jesus stops and says who touched me the disciples say Lord in this crowd everyone's touching you it's possible to be in his presence 
and not receive of his power because you lack faith. I'm just telling you what the Bible teaches. Now, this is not me attempting to blame people for not being healed or not being delivered or not having their lives transformed. We also, as ministers, bear responsibility to have faith for people as well. And we understand that God is sovereign and often works, in fact, always works in his own timing. But that does not mean that God doesn't require faith. It's time to begin to think like God thinks. We sometimes laugh at the idea of a miracle. We sometimes become cynical because it's been so long that we've been believing for a miracle. And if you don't guard your heart, then you can begin to have your heart hardened simply by the time it takes to see the miracle come to pass. People often find themselves in difficult circumstances that are extended years of suffering, months of suffering, weeks of suffering. And because of the length of time it takes to see the miracle, they allow faith to diminish. My friend, I would rather go the rest of my life believing that God can do what he says he can do than to give up one minute before the miracle happens. We must begin to think like God thinks. The Bible says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or even imagine. Yet we pray prayers limited to our understanding. We pray prayers that are limited to our ability. Well, we might as well be praying to ourselves if we only pray prayers based on our power and ability. You're not praying to yourself. You're not just throwing out wishes and hopes. You're addressing the God of the universe who has the power to perform that which he promised. Hebrews 11, please. Hebrews 11, I'm going to read several verses. Beginning at verse 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. The King James Version words it, faith is the substance of things hoped for. My friend, we often imagine that the miracle is years away. And if you can put it in distance, miles away. The miracle can seem so small because it seems so far and it's difficult to rejoice today for a miracle you think can only come tomorrow. Or we think that the setting isn't right or we think that the situation isn't quite what it should be. I've seen some of the most incredible miracles in some of the most plain settings. God can do anything, anytime. And if I have the faith for it, the Bible says faith is the substance. The substance, it is a spiritual substance. So that if I can believe for it, it's substance. If I can believe for it, if I can see it, if God will promise it, if God has declared it and I place my faith in what he has said, not in what he didn't say, in what he did say, then my believing for it is as good as receiving it. Faith is the substance. The substance. Am I saying that you can wish your way to a miracle? No. Am I saying that you can name it and claim it? No. I'm talking about coming into agreement with what God has declared. Now, verse 2 says this. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Faith 
is understanding. Faith is spiritual understanding. When you face trials and circumstances that you cannot comprehend, you'll find yourself often asking, why God did you allow it? When tragedy strikes, why God did you allow it? The death of a loved one, why God did you allow it? Believing for a miracle and it didn't quite happen like you thought it should. Why God did you allow it? And as I said just a few moments ago, if you're not careful to guard your heart, you can become bitter and worse, bitter toward God. But faith doesn't just believe for the miracle. Please hear this now. Because I don't want anyone leaving here saying that I'm saying that you can just name it and claim it. That, that's very shallow. Faith doesn't just believe for the miracle. Faith also trusts God when the miracle doesn't come to pass like you thought it should. That's the not so popular part. Believe for the miracle today. Not tomorrow, today. And if it doesn't happen today, say thank God that it could happen tomorrow. Amen. The Bible says by faith we understand. Sometimes when questions mount, when, when you begin to struggle with the question of why, 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 there are, there are no easy answers because I could give you a theological answer that would help you think about it, but it would do nothing to address how you feel about it. It's not always just as simple as giving a theological response. This is where faith comes in. It's by faith we understand what God is doing. Not with the, 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 the mind of, of the flesh, not with, with human reasoning but rather in the spirit knowing God, whatever this is, whatever you're doing, I trust you and I'm gonna continue to take steps on the path that you've laid before me. I don't have to have all the answers as they would be understood in the natural mind. I don't have to have all the theological reasonings as to why so-and-so wasn't healed or why so-and-so died or why the financial miracle wasn't done or why the marriage didn't make it or why the child is still sick. I don't have to have all of the theological answers, but one response I do have, and that's faith. Trusting you, even though I don't understand it. It's by faith we understand. Sometimes the only answer is to just trust God. Verse 4. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. Faith is demonstrated in giving God your best. Compromise, please hear me now. Compromise is a symptom of doubt. Compromise is a symptom of doubt. We withhold from God because part of us hesitates because part of us believes that maybe he's not quite as able as I thought he was. It got really quiet just now. Compromise is a symptom of doubt. The way you live your life, you compromise in your holiness. You compromise in your prayer life. You compromise in your devotion to the word. You compromise in your surrender and obedience and trust toward God. It's a symptom of doubt. Because there's still a part that may believe that God might not come through. There was a game I used to play with my cousins. I think some people still play it today. It was the trust fall game where you would stand, your back facing whoever was supposed to catch you, and the game is you just fall backwards. 
and see if they catch you. Well, there were certain people who I had no issue trusting. I would just fall back. And then there was those, those one or two cousins or when I'd fall, it was constantly checking. And that, that, that placing the foot backwards was that hesitation. It was, I'm not quite sure if they're going to catch me. That's compromise. Instead of just falling back into the promises of God, sometimes you put your foot back to catch yourself. Compromise. Hesitation. Compromise is a symptom of doubt. Verse 5, it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. Before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It's by faith that we walk in closeness with God. Far too many of us are hindered in our fellowship with God, not because we don't want to have fellowship with God and not because God doesn't want to have fellowship with us. The problem is for many believers, for most believers I would dare say, is that they hesitate to believe that that connection is actually there. So that when they approach him, they're not quite sure if they actually have what he says he gave to them. It was by faith that Enoch walked so closely with God that he was not for God took him. I love the way the scripture words that. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. I said to the Lord when I read that, Lord, I want to be a was not too. I want to be an empty space through which the glory of God can manifest and transform the earthly into the heavenly. I want to be a surrendered vessel so that when people look at me, they don't see me, they see Jesus. I want my words to be empty of my own motive and my own heart and my own ambition so that when I speak, they hear Jesus speaking. I want to be a was not to. How do you do that? Faith. You can't walk with God in that way if you don't believe he wants to walk with you. You can't walk with God in that way if you don't believe that you're still connected with him even after a mistake that you made. You can't walk with God in that way if you don't believe that the cross was enough to purchase that connection. Continuing now, verse 7. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Noah did what God called him to do, even when others mocked and criticized him for it. You want to live a life of faith? And sometimes God will tell you to do something that others will not understand. Sometimes God will give you instructions that you don't understand. Build an ark. Okay, Lord. Others asking, why is he building an ark? It had not rained up to that point. Maybe it was a prophetic metaphor, they thought. Maybe it was just God demonstrating that he was obedient, that Noah was obedient. Who knows what they thought it was? He didn't know the purpose, not the full intent of what God was doing. People criticized it. You know, you who are in ministry will understand this more than anyone. You do something for God, and it, it brings out the critics like, like worms in the mud when it rains. They just surface. Bit of a harsh analogy, but I think it serves a purpose. And here he is doing what God told him to do, and others come along and criticize. There will be seasons, my friend, in your walk with God when you have no clue what he's doing. He'll tell you something. He'll give you an instruction. 
And it's up to you to take that step of faith, even when you can't see where the path ends. This is what Noah did. By faith, Noah did what called him, God called him to do, even when others mocked and criticized. By faith, Noah obeyed God, even when he couldn't see the full picture. Verse 8 It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And he even reached the land God promised him. He lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in the tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. Faith abandons the familiar for the sake of obedience. You follow after a life of faith, God is going to call you away from that which is familiar to you. Abraham was doing just fine. He was established. He was wealthy. He was influential. He was doing just fine. And God said, leave it all and go. Leave that place of familiarity. Leave that place where you've been established. And go to a place that will show you. And he got moving without even knowing where he was going. That's faith. Faith in action. The Bible says in verse 11... It was by faith that Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise, and so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. Faith sees the miracle even when the situation is impossible. Maybe you've been dealing with the sickness, the disease, for a long time. And the doctors are telling you that there's absolutely nothing that they can do for you. Maybe you've battled with mental anguish, depression, Anxiety, mental illness. Perhaps there's a spiritual bondage from which you just can't seem to break free. And what we begin to do in these situations sometimes is we begin to compare where we are with where others are, hoping that it gives us some type of answer. Well, how long were you sick before God healed you? Has God ever healed this sickness before? Do you know of anyone? And we start to base our reasoning on the natural. But faith sees the impossible. Faith knows that God is able, even when the situation doesn't seem to be changing, even when you've gone through it for so long that your hope is fading, even when the doctors tell you there's no hope, even when the psychiatrists tell you there's no hope, even when your friends and family tell you there's no hope, even when you look for stories that would be similar to a testimony that you want and you can't find it, I want you to know that faith can receive it if it just stays intact. (laughs) Only believe. Only believe. Faith sees the miracle even when it looks impossible. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. Verse 13, they did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God For he has prepared a city for them. Faith is heavenly minded, not bound to the limitations of this world. Do you realize, and I'm going to say this, and you probably have already heard it, and you probably 
intellectually at least have accepted the idea. But I'm wondering if the truth of what I'm about to say has truly permeated your entire being. I wonder if you've realized the implications, big and small, of the truth I'm about to say to you. You are not earthly, you are heavenly. Really, really think about that. Yes, before Christ, we were all sinners. And be very, very careful of theology that that, that just continues to, to condemn you even after you've come to Christ. Christ redeemed us, changed our nature. He didn't leave us the same. Or the blood of Jesus isn't powerful enough to transform. You are of the heavenly realm. This is what faith sees, and this is what's so difficult for many believers to grasp. You see, because so many of us are so busy, our our minds are so consumed by the memory of who we were that we just can't bring ourselves to accept the fact that we are completely new creations and even subtle lies like you don't deserve it. Well, that's not even really a lie. None of us deserve it. But Jesus deserves to reap the reward of his suffering. And we, we, we approach God like we're groveling. Oh, I'm just, I'm just a filthy, lowly sinner. And, and people who think this way and base their whole, their whole view of God and themselves on this see God as angry and vindictive. Yes, he's angry with the wicked every day, but I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I've been redeemed. So that, so that when, when people ask who you are, you say, I'm a, I, I'm, think about it, and we say this, but we don't really, we don't really allow the truth of what we're saying to, to, fully, to fully consume us. That when you say you're a child of God, yet still think so little of yourself, do you really believe what you're saying? That God... The one who formed all of reality as we know it. Creator of heaven and earth. Eternal, holy, all-powerful, all-knowing. That I am his child. That is my father. You are a heavenly ambassador just journeying through this earth. That's why I, 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 I become so, my heart breaks when I see Christians talking about the devil and demons as if the devil and demons have so much power over them. Do you realize who my father is? I want you to think about this. Christ is seated in power. I am seated in Christ. When, 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 when you rebuke a demonic being, it's as if Christ himself is giving that order. Think about that. Now, an analogy I use is that God is the source of that light. We are just reflections, like a mirror. The moment we turn our face away, that light dims. We are not God. There's only one God. But we are his children. We belong to him. And faith sees that. Faith sees the heavenly and not just the earthly. You see how just for a moment just now, even when you turned your attention to that reality, how things just began to shift even in you. That's faith. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Verse 18, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son to whom your descendants will be counted. 
Verse 19, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was willing to bring him to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Faith offers a costly sacrifice. We have to stop calling it that, though. And I use that term all the time. I'm still trying to correct myself. This is a sacrifice I've made unto God. I prefer to call it surrender. Because a sacrifice implies that I've given something up. Nothing belongs to me anyway. Nothing I have, nothing I accomplish, none of that belongs to me. I promise you, there's nothing you will give to God that he won't replace with something better. There's no such thing really as sacrifice. But faith is able to surrender to God precisely because faith knows that he's able to do it. Faith knows that there's nothing I can give to God that he won't give back to me that will be better. Faith knows that whatever I suffer now, it does not compare to the glory of then. We'll read just a few more verses. Verse 20. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings to the future of his, to, to his future sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. There's a story about a little boy who came to a healing service and he wasn't able to walk. And he received prayer. God healed him. The miracle was done. And he went home and put on the pair of shoes that he had been saving all along. Faith. Faith. Faith pleases God before it pleases people. Faith knows its identity. Faith endures suffering. Faith has eyes to see. Faith is that bridge between the earthly and the heavenly. And I'm telling you, We're so consumed by the world so often that we don't realize just how close we are to the things of the supernatural. You don't realize how close we are to angelic hosts. You don't realize how close that miracle is. We don't realize how close we are to an encounter in his presence that can mark us forever. Faith. By faith, we step out of the natural and into the supernatural. It's by faith. That's all it takes. My friend, I did not come here tonight with a complicated teaching or word. It's simple, 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 simple. Faith. All things are possible. All things are possible. Whatever you're suffering with, whenever the pain, I just sense such a shift in the atmosphere right now. I want to be very attentive to that. Give me just a second. Pray in the Holy Spirit just for a second. I'm seeing also those of you watching online, I can see all the different comments and 
I want you to begin to write your prayer requests. Lift your hands, please. Pray in the Holy Spirit. There's a woman here tonight. You're, you came with, a, with, a, with a, a, a severe, severe sickness. And you know it's you because you were asking for the Lord to give you some type of moment like this. I want to pray with you now. Ma'am, I, I, know, I know there's all kinds of sickness, but, but, but what I'm seeing is something that causes you pain, Daily, it's, I mean, it, is, it is absolute suffering. I need to know who that woman is. Please. That's you on the front. Is it okay with you if I ask what you're suffering with? Were you the one who asked the Lord to have you called out? By faith, you said? Stretch your hands toward her, please. And, and you said, you don't have to say it on the microphone. Tell me in my ear again. Pray, guys, pray. Jesus, we love you, we honor you. The Lord is challenging you tonight. And you're saying, Lord, I need you to help my faith. I know it was a simple message. That was the intention. Tomorrow morning, I'll do a teaching. But tonight, I just wanted to challenge your faith. But you're in this room and you're saying, I need the grace of the Holy Spirit to empower me in the area of my faith. If you're watching online, just say, that's me. You can write that in the comments. If that's you here, come stand at this altar. We're going to pray right now. Just lift your hands and ask him to touch your life. What's your name? Your name. What's your name? Jacob. Jacob. Do you want God to use you, Jacob? How old are you? You're 15? What are you feeling on you right now, Jacob? The glory of the glory of God. What does that feel like on your body? <laughs> oh, 
a weight of heat. Lift your hands, Jacob. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus, make Jacob a preacher. Let him reach his generation with your power and for your glory in the mighty name of Jesus. That's the glory of God here. Lift your hands and pray this prayer. Say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit teach, me teach me to surrender. To surrender. Teach, me teach me to have faith. To have faith. Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit, help me, help me to, be to be sensitive to your voice. Voice. Give me the boldness boldness. to obey obey. in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? Beautiful presence of the Lord here. Go back to your seat just for a couple of minutes, please. Jesus, we honor you. And as you're beginning to take your seats, I want to also acknowledge those who are watching online. God bless you. I still that you're, you're joining us from all around the world. We bless you in the name of Jesus. I have just a few announcements to make. And then course, we're going to be ministering to the sick and those who need deliverance in just a few minutes. So I want you to prepare your heart for what the Holy Spirit is going to do in just a matter of minutes. Those of you who've been to these services before know that the atmosphere changes suddenly and there's a shift in the room and miracles begin to happen. So I want you to allow your faith to be stirred for that. But I have a few things I want to announce And these are very exciting ministry developments. And I know that God is going to use every single one of these things for his glory. Are you ready to hear some exciting announcements from our ministry? We have to remember that the gospel message is for the world. The gospel message is for every nation, every language, every culture. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 say this. After these things I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's one of the many things I look forward to in heaven. Seeing the nations of the world crying out with one voice, declaring the glory of God. What a sight that will be. all of us together joining in heavenly song, harmonizing with angelic beings, glorifying the Lamb of God. We're very excited to announce that the vision of the ministry is expanding. You know, since the beginning, and this was over 20 years ago now that we started, believe it or not, it's been 20 years of ministry. Since the beginning, we've really only done ministry in English. Now, English is the most utilized language in terms of how it crosses over from nation to nation and culture to culture. But we want to continue to expand what God is doing through this ministry. We want to reach more people than ever before. And this ministry has been given a simple mandate to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit through events and media. And so after looking into this, we're taking a step forward, and we've discovered that the fourth most spoken language in the world is Spanish. Over 500 million people speak Spanish. 
And this will be the first of many things that we do like this. We, of course, want to do the same for other languages and other tongues. That's something, of course, we are going to begin to develop. That's, that, that's just the next step, naturally. But I'm very pleased to announce that we are now officially launching, in addition to everything that we're doing. This is not replacing anything. None of these things are replacing anything. They're being added to what we're doing. I want you to give the Lord a hand of praise because we are launching now a Spanish channel on YouTube. And this channel is already up and running. It's working, it's functioning. And by the way, this is not just a Spanish channel, it's a Spanish ministry. And what I mean by that is that we've implemented all of the systems and structures to this whole new outreach. So this isn't just a channel where we throw some subtitles on. We've done this with a lot of excellence and quality. Of course, you know how we do everything. We want to do everything as unto the Lord. And this Spanish channel is no different. This Spanish ministry is not going to be treated like second rate. And I think that sometimes happens when we add different languages onto different things. Kind of the second language just is just kind of treated not as well as the first thing that we started. You know, that happens sometimes. And I don't think that's anyone's intention ever. But we don't want to let that happen. We're putting everything we have into making sure that this is run with quality and excellence. The program is not just subtitled there. It's actually a dubbed voice. There's a voice actor we found who kind of sounds like me. So we'll see. The Spanish audience may, may, may notice a slight difference, uh, but it's actually dubbed, and we're going to be releasing those on a weekly basis. Uh, we've also uh, started on the administrative end. There's now someone we're bringing in to handle Spanish correspondence, a Spanish partner base. We actually even developed a Spanish website. We're going to be keeping up with all of these things. And again, this is just the first of many of the different languages that we're going to be adding. We, of course, want to add more and more and more as God begins to expand the ministry. But we just added to our potential reach another 500 million people who can be potentially reached by this. The second thing I'm going to announce tonight, Psalm chapter 145, verse 4. Our generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. God's plans are so big that they don't just work from person to person, but from generation to generation. All generations present here on the earth need each other. We as a ministry have been very focused and very intentional about making sure that we're reaching all generations. There's, we've never limited what we're doing. But there's been something that's been on my heart lately. And that is this statistic, I don't know if you want to call it a statistic, a piece of information, that I just can't get out of my head. And that is that Gen Z, this next up and coming generation, is the most suicidal, is the most depressed, is the most anxious. No wonder because Generation Z is the first post-Christian generation in America. What do I mean by that? I mean, guys, Gen Z is predominantly atheist. That's the first time that's happened in this nation. Now, we believe in reaching all generations, which we do now. But we are going to take some special effort to now reaching to the future generation. I, I, I don't just think in terms of here and now. I'm young, relatively speaking. I don't think Gen Z would think so, but I am. If I say it enough, it will be true. <laughs> I'm 33 years old. I'll be 34 in March. But even I know I have to be thinking about the future. I'm already thinking of how we, we are already now structuring the ministry so that 15, 20 years from now, I can begin to hand it over to other evangelists so that it's not, so it doesn't die with me because it's going to go like that going to go like that. And we have to be mindful of that. But the enemy is after Gen Z, just like he's after every generation. 
But those tactics are so vicious. They're confused, hopeless, uh, uh, generally speaking, of course. There are exceptions, but think about the confusion just surrounding their identity. They don't even know how God created them to be. Not even at the very base level do they understand their identity. And so our ministry is taking a step of faith in developing something new. And we've been working on it for the past several months and planning and making sure that everything is done properly. We, of course, as I said with the other announcement, are doing this in addition to everything that we're doing. So this is not replacing anything that we're doing. Uh, We have officially begun, and I'm announcing here tonight, that starting in just a matter of weeks, we are going to begin accepting applications for our young adult internship program. And this is something that I'm excited about because it's going to be done under our ministry, the Holy Spirit School. It's the Holy Spirit School Internship. Now, don't be offended if you're not Gen Z and say, well, I want it to take the internship because the Holy Spirit School has online courses that anyone can take. And in fact, we're also looking from people for people from all generations to act as older brothers, older sisters, mothers and mother and father figures to the people we will, we will bring in. So we need everybody involved, okay? Everyone's going to be involved with this. But we're going to mentor and focus on building up Generation Z leaders. Now, we are looking for young men and young women who are already serious about their commitment to Christ and who sense a call into ministry. We want to train them, not just in general Bible training, not just in general spiritual growth. We are going to focus this internship program on finding these key leaders and empowering them to become five-fold ministry leaders. We want to find future pastors, evangelists, teachers, prophets, apostles. And so that's what we're going to begin doing. I know all the information can be gathered. We'll get that information to you. We'll be announcing more information online. But this is something I'm asking you to pray for because this is going to be so key. And by empowering these leaders, we are sending workers back into the harvest field of a generation. The third and final announcement, I was inspired by this scripture, Matthew 24, 14. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. It is the announcement of the gospel message to all around the world that triggers the coming of the Lord Jesus. I am so tired of doomsday sayers. I am so tired of doom and gloom preaching. Let's make this absolutely clear. The end cannot come until the church is victorious. The gospel shall be preached. Now that victory may not look like success in the way that the world measures success. But success for us is that the gospel goes throughout the nations of the world. This ministry, since its inception, has had a vision for mass evangelism through media. And so many of you have heard me talk about this before. And I am very happy to finally be announcing that we are officially opening our studio. Encounter TV Studios opens in March. And so this is going to be a grand opening March 4th of this year. And the reason this is such a big deal to us is because this is going to help us to expand our reach further than ever before. I'm telling you this right now. We steward the Lord's ministry. This is His, and He is just getting started with His ministry. This is only the beginning. So we have a vision. The gospel is for every culture, which is why we're expanding with the Spanish ministry and beyond. The gospel is for every generation, which is why we're reaching out to the most unreached generation, Gen Z. The gospel is for all people everywhere, which is why we're expanding our media reach with this new studio. 
We're not just talking about it. We're doing it unto the glory of God. This is God's doing. I need you to get behind it. I need you, the people of God, the church at large, everyone watching online, to rally behind what God is doing through His work. It is not ours, it is His. And so we are seeing it happen. If you can measure it in terms of success, I would say that the standard of success is that people are being saved, healed, delivered, set free, and empowered to do what God has called them to do. So if you're tired of looking around the world and saying, God, is anything ever going to change? God, are we ever going to see victory? If you're tired of seeing the way things are going in our generations, if you're tired of the way it seems that darkness is permeating the globe with no one to put it in check, then I want you to have faith with us because we're not going to stand by while the enemy steals the soul of these generations. If you're tired of seeing that, if you're tired of feeling powerless to do anything about what's happening around the world, then I want you to join us because we're seeing the difference being made. I want you to join your prayer with our prayers, your resources with our resources, your efforts with our efforts. It is happening. We are seeing it work. We just need some help. And I'm asking you to do that. There are business people watching. There are pastors watching. There are mothers and fathers watching. All of us have a responsibility to pour resources into God's work. I will tell you this. I cannot promise you that if you give this, you'll get that. Or that if you sow a magic number, that in a certain amount of magic days, that you'll have a magic thing happen. I can't promise that. We don't teach that. We don't believe that. What I can tell you is this. You pour resources into this ministry and we'll become an effective weapon in God's hand. The nations of the world belong to Jesus. The nations of the world belong to Jesus. Help us go to the nations. Help us continue to do all that we're doing. In addition to everything I announced, we're going to continue holding events like these around the world. We're going to continue to broadcast live streams. We're going to continue to create content that's going to edify the body of Christ. I just need your help. Ushers, would you please come forward? And I want you to pass out the envelopes. Those of you watching online, there will be a link that you can give through. In a moment, we're going to begin praying for your miracle, for your deliverance. But first, I'm asking that the people of God would have a heart and hear what the Lord is doing. Now, to be clear, your giving is not tied to your healing miracle. Your giving is not tied to your deliverance. I think I've covered that multiple times. But it is important that we, the people of God, give for the purpose of the vision of the kingdom. And so as you give, I want you to remember that what you give is actually making impact. Now, you'll look on your envelope. You can see. In fact, we should be passing out the envelopes now. You'll get them in just a moment. So everyone will get a stack and take one and pass it down. What I want you to do is look on the envelope. You'll see a QR code. I want you to scan that QR code. And it's going to give you a very accurate read of where we are with just covering this event alone. With all of the production, with the renting of the venue, with all of the travel costs, we do have costs to run these events. And so I want you to take a look at what the need is, and I'm asking you to give in a way that we can meet that need. And you watching online, you'll see the link to give. Uh, those who are attending in person are seeing the, the link with all that, the goal and so forth. But those of you online will get a general link. And I want you to give as the Holy Spirit leads you. And as we're passing that out, I want you to remember that as you give, you're participating with global evangelism. It is working. God is doing it. It's happening. 
And as the people of God stand behind the vision, I know that we're going to begin to see a shift in this generation. We're going to begin to see a shift in this world. This is what it takes to reach the nations. It takes selflessness. It takes giving of our resources. It takes prayers. It takes it all. This is how God chooses to work in the earth through ministries that we all might participate. And as you're filling out that envelope, I want to thank you for your support. I don't take it lightly. I know that many of you are giving out of a place of need. Some are giving out of a place of abundance. But however you are giving, just remember why we're doing this. We do this because there's a generation that needs it. We do this because the nations need it. We do it because there are souls that need to be won. And there are lives that need to be transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's time that people begin to see the power of God. It's time that people see the power of God. And I can actually begin to see those giving online right now. I can see some of the donations coming in. I want to just thank a few of you who are giving. And again, you can participate in giving whether you're watching online or on the replay. Thank you to Josh for your support. Thank you, Ariana, Gonzalo, and Tyson, and Elvira, and Margaret, and Jimmy. And thank you also to Aaron and many others who are supporting. Thank you for your support. I'll give you just a few moments to fill that out. If you're looking for a quicker way to do it besides the envelope, you can just use that QR code. It is the fastest way. Um, and it's also more helpful for our team because with the envelope, sometimes uh, people write in tongues, and so it's a little difficult to read. Uh, but with the digital medium, it makes it more uh, legible, so it, makes our, our, it gives our staff an easier time. But as you're supporting, again, one more time, I just want to thank you. Thank you for that support. Now, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bless those who give tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would cause them to become weapons in your hand. Fund them, Lord. Give them greater resources that they might continue to fund your kingdom. Father, it's not lost on us. The opportunity that's before us. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of participating in your great commission. We pray that you would bless our efforts. Bless these resources, Lord. And cause them to be used against the enemy. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. 